What do you think of when I say conspiracy theory? Perhaps you think of specific examples. There are lots to choose from. Some are bizarre, like the idea that Elvis faked his own death. Or that Britain's royal family are actually shape-shifting lizards. Or that a flying saucer crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. There's a growing number of people who think the world is actually flat. Some people seriously believe the cloud-like trails you see in the sky that are left behind by aeroplanes are actually a cocktail of chemicals being deliberately sprayed over people by governments trying to control them. A lot of conspiracy theories relate to politics. That 9-11 was orchestrated by the US government so it could start wars in the Middle East. That JFK wasn't assassinated by a lone gunman. That powerful groups like the Illuminati are pulling the strings behind the scenes, plotting to establish a new world order. Other prominent conspiracy theories include the anti-vaccination movement and climate change denial. This is an incredibly wide-ranging phenomenon. And it's not something that's confined to the margins of society. Opinion polls show that the majority of citizens in Europe and the US believe in one or more conspiracy theories. Some conspiracy theories may be harmless entertainment or a sign of healthy skepticism. But others are dangerous because they can fuel racism, violence and terrorism. With the prominence of conspiracy theories seemingly on the rise, I've set out to better understand them. You're listening to the expert guide to conspiracy theories from the Conversations Ant Hill podcast. I'm your host, Annabelle Bly. Over five episodes, we will speak to psychologists to find out why some people are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories than others. People believe in conspiracy theories for three main reasons. That is to satisfy three quite specific psychological motives. We will explore the history of conspiracy theories. Some say they've been around since hunter-gatherer times. We still carry with us this ancient instinct not to easily trust groups that we perceive as different. We'll discover the different ways that conspiracy theories spread. You get these kind of parodies, these sort of self-mocking YouTube videos that are made in teenagers' bedrooms where they're kind of joking about the whole notion that you could believe in the Illuminati. And then two recommends away, you've suddenly got something which is really extreme anti-Semitic content. And we'll find out how dangerous they can be. Psychologically, former terrorists and members of extremist organizations are not very different from conspiracy theorists. In fact, There is probably no radical extremist movement in the world that is not also involving a conspiracy. Nearly everyone we'll be speaking to in this series is part of an international network of researchers associated with the COST-funded COMPACT project. COST stands for European Cooperation in Science and Technology and is basically a big EU research fund. And COMPACT stands for the Comparative Analysis of Conspiracy Theories. The COMPACT is made up of around 150 researchers from around the world, and we've interviewed lots of them for this series. To kick things off, I spoke to the research group's chair, Peter Knight. I'm Peter Knight, and I'm a professor of American studies at the University of Manchester. You might remember Peter from our To the Moon and Beyond series, which marked the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. He was on episode two, explaining why lots of people believe the moon landings were faked. I asked him why he brought together this group of conspiracy theory researchers in 2016. I think one of the motivations was the sense that conspiracy theories are increasingly visible, both with the rise of right wing populism in in the US and in Europe, but also with the growth of conspiracy theories or the the increasing prominence of conspiracy theories on the internet. And obviously here we're thinking about the rise of fake news and misinformation and uh, the growth of kind of post-truth politics. And, you know, perhaps more than anything, it was um, the rise of Trump who became, you know, who's become in effect the conspiracy theorist in chief in the White House. Now, that may sound like a controversial thing to say about a sitting US president, but Donald Trump has parroted a number of conspiracy theories, 
before, during and after his successful 2016 presidential run. His grandmother said he was born in Kenya and she was there and witnessed the birth, okay? He doesn't have a birth certificate or he hasn't shown. It'll get a little cooler, it'll get a little warmer like it always has for millions of years. It'll get cooler, it'll get warmer, it's called weather. Just the other day, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine. A week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. While conspiracy theories certainly seem to be having a moment, Peter Knight is keen to point out that they have been around for a long time. And while it's tempting sometimes to treat conspiracy theories as a form of light-hearted entertainment, particularly when they relate to aliens and the royal family, actually they are a complex phenomenon that needs to be taken seriously. One of the things we've come to understand is that conspiracy theories have a long and complicated history. They're not just a present-day phenomenon, but they've taken very different forms and they have very different meanings and functions in different political regimes and in different historical moments. But I think we've also begun to see that there's a quite depressing recurrence of particular conspiracy narratives. And, you know, the obvious example here would be anti-Semitism. We're going to spend the rest of this episode asking what exactly makes something a conspiracy theory? What does the Illuminati have in common with anti-vaxxers and 9-11 truthers? And what's the difference between a conspiracy theory and well-founded suspicions about people in power not telling the truth? You know, in some ways, conspiracy theory is like pornography in that classic definition from an obscenity trial in the States in the 1960s. The judge famously said, I know it when I see it. This is the thing. There is something slippery about the concept of conspiracy theories. But for those looking for something a little more concrete, Peter says there are three important characteristics to most of them. The three basic assumptions are, first, that nothing happens by accident. The idea that in history there are no coincidences and no cock-ups. The second idea is that nothing is as it seems. The suggestion that you need to look beneath the surface to detect the actions and the intentions of the evil conspirators. And the third idea is that everything is connected. So if you dig deep enough, you'll find hidden connections between people, institutions and events that explain what's really going on. As political scientist Michael Barkun puts it, nothing happens by accident, nothing is as it seems, and everything is connected. Now, one of the difficulties with defining conspiracy theories is the fact that history is littered with real plots and conspiracies. This is something Kasim Kassam, a philosopher at Warwick University, points out in his book, Conspiracy Theories. Supposing you start off by saying what a conspiracy is. So a conspiracy, you might think, is where you have a small group of people working together in secret to do something illegal or harmful. And then a conspiracy theory, you might naturally suppose, is just an attempt to explain a significant event by reference to a conspiracy. You know, Guy Fawkes conspired to blow up the Houses of Parliament as part of the gunpowder plot. US President Richard Nixon and his co-conspirators bugged the opposition party's Watergate offices in 1972. The NSA spies on people. America has meddled with the political systems of lots of countries. There is a long history of secret schemes, both by people in power and those plotting against them. So it is not unreasonable in some circumstances for people to develop theories that current events might be the result of a behind-the-scenes conspiracy. So if you think about 9-11, of course, there are many conspiracy theories about 9-11, all of which claim in one way or another that 9-11 was an inside job. Um, On the other hand, if you read the report of the official 9-11 commission, it's fairly clear that that report also explains 9-11 by reference to a conspiracy. In the case of the official account, the conspiracy was an Al-Qaeda conspiracy to destroy the Twin Towers and other targets in the US. So there was a conspiracy behind 9-11, a conspiracy by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. But this isn't the same as a conspiracy theory. 
When we talk about conspiracy theories, we are talking about something that's incredibly speculative and that specifically goes against the official version of events. I mean, of course, a successful conspiracy is one that, you know, leaves behind very few traces. So discovering that a conspiracy has occurred is really, as conspiracy theorists themselves like to say, a matter of, you know, connecting the dots, of picking up on little anomalies and bits of evidence that the conspirators failed to cover up. And this means that conspiracy theories are speculative in a way that historical theories about conspiracies tend not to be. Right? So if you think about, you know, leave aside 9-11, but a kind of much more straightforward case, the theory that Guy Fawkes plotted to blow up Parliament with some of his colleagues in 1605, that isn't a speculative account of what happened. I mean, that's based on concrete historical and documentary evidence. Peter Knight describes conspiracy theories as going against the received wisdom of the time. Yeah, so if conspiracy theories go against received wisdom, it's slightly more complicated than simply they're opposing the mainstream uh, uh, view of events. Because in some cases, you know, the official view of events is itself a conspiracy theory. But I think there is always that idea, or certainly there has been for large parts of history, that conspiracy theories are challenging the received version of events. They're trying to claim that their explanation is revealing what's really going on, whereas the official version or the received wisdom is somehow duped, that people, uh, most people are mistaken. This is where things get tricky, though. For some researchers, it's not so easy to find the line between a conspiracy theory and what's considered legitimate knowledge. After all, who decides what knowledge is legitimate and what isn't? In my book, Knowledge Goes Pop, I try to think about what does it mean if we situate conspiracy theories as a form of knowledge. Claire Birchall is a reader in contemporary culture at King's College London. I asked her what she meant by legitimate knowledge. I suppose it's things that experts say, it's things that academics might say, it's also things that have become true over time just by repetition, so common sense, that kind of understanding of the world. But it's also the official stories that get produced by official centres of um, legitimacy like the law courts or Westminster or the university. So it's about institutions as much as it is about the people who are saying them. Nobody wants to think of themselves as a conspiracy theorist. Least of all those people in society who are usually associated with rationality and reason. Those people that are charged with producing that legitimate knowledge. But, Claire argues... Lots of theories and ways of thinking inside universities have some similarities to the logic used by conspiracy theorists. And it's this closeness that can make some academics feel uncomfortable. Everybody in the academy, everybody who wants to think of themselves as a rational interpreter of the world, it makes them uncomfortable. And that's why conspiracy theory becomes this pejorative term, because it's like, well, everybody else is the conspiracy theorist, and I am just an objective interpreter of the world. And what I'm trying to say is that conspiracy theories always need to be thought relationally, in relationship to other ways of interpreting the world, other ways of producing knowledge about the world. Calling someone a conspiracy theorist is one way of simply shutting down an argument. The label can serve as an insult, implying you don't need to take the person or their ideas seriously. Some academics go further and they say that there is no such thing as a conspiracy theory. There's just conspiracy panics. So Jack Brattage has a book, Conspiracy Panics, and he's arguing that conspiracy theory is only ever a term that's used in order to protect your own knowledge boundary, really, to protect your own position. This kind of labelling or refusal to engage with people who believe in conspiracy theories can also be dangerous. We'll be hearing later in the series about how simply dismissing some people as conspiracy theorists when they question official narratives can cause them to become more hardline in their conspiracy theory beliefs. While some early research on conspiracy theories treated them as a delusional way of thinking... Scholars have more recently moved away from associating those who believe in conspiracy theories simply with paranoia or mental instability. 
This is partly down to research showing the prominence of conspiracy thinking among intellectual and political elites, but also how widespread belief in conspiracy theories is among the general population. It's partly because of this that Claire says we need to be careful about disparaging conspiracy theorists and thinking that we are so different from them. There are some conspiracy theories that I feel very strongly that I I don't subscribe to. But I also know that if you dig deep enough, you talk to someone long enough, there will be something which sounds a little bit like a conspiracy theory. And so we all need to be a little bit careful about who we're calling a conspiracy theorist and why. Actually, there are a number of conspiracy theories that seem a lot less crazy when you scratch beneath the surface of why people believe in them. Peter Knight looks at how conspiracy theories reflect certain moments in history and the wider issues that were going on at the time. If we take, for example, conspiracy theories in African-American communities in the US since the sort of 60s and 70s, one way of looking at them is that this is a case of a community that's shooting itself in the foot, that it's turning to conspiracy theories as a form of explanation that is fundamentally misguided, it's latching onto the wrong targets, and that it causes more harm than, than it should. This is a community that experienced medical neglect and harm at an institutional level, what we'd call institutional racism today. And conspiracy theories to them made sense. They were a way to explain the deep patterns of prejudice that they experienced. Prominent conspiracy theories among the African-American community that persist to this day include the idea that vaccinations are a plot by the US government to sterilise black men and that the CIA started the AIDS epidemic. And on the face of it, these are kind of absolutely crazy conspiracy theories where there is very little evidence that they could be remotely plausible and what's more, that they can lead to very damaging behaviours. You know, we know that people who believe in conspiracy theories about AIDS or about vaccinations are far less likely to engage in uh, safe sex or have um, vaccinations themselves. And yet, and yet, these conspiracy theories latch on to important historical truths about the centuries-long neglect of African-Americans in, in American history. And the classic case that's pointed to again and again is the Tuskegee um, syphilis studies. The Tuskegee syphilis study was a big research project looking into the effects of syphilis. It went on from 1932 to 1972, and all the participants were African-American men with syphilis who were told they'd receive free health care for taking part in the study. But instead of being given penicillin, which became the standard treatment for syphilis from 1947 onwards, these men just weren't treated. Many died from the disease, infected their partners, and 19 children were born with congenital syphilis as a result. This actual mistreatment by medical authorities is believed to fuel some of the distrust and medical conspiracy theories which remain prominent among sections of the African-American community today. Yeah, obviously some conspiracy theories at surface level seem really, really implausible. But I think, you know, we might make a distinction between things that are implausible and ideas that are intelligible or at least make some kind of sense if we understand more about the backstory of why do people believe in these particular conspiracy theories? What are the kind of images, the metaphors, the narratives, and how do they relate to the wider culture in which these conspiracy theories emerge? You're listening to The Expert Guide to Conspiracy Theories, a five-part series from The Conversations and Hill podcast. Subscribe to get the next four episodes, which are coming out over the next four weeks. And if you're a fan of the podcast, please consider giving us a rating or review wherever you listen. It helps us reach more people. I have to say, one of the favourite things I learnt about for this episode was the fact that the actual terms conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist and the way that we actually understand these concepts are very recent. Now, that might be because deep down I'm a bit of a history geek, 
but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. So for this, I spoke to Andrew Mackenzie McCogg, senior research fellow at the Australian Catholic University, who's working on a book that maps out the conceptual history of conspiracy theories. Conceptual history is simply a way of approaching history where we do not take the concepts that we use for granted. So there's always the danger that we take something such as class or even such a very general concept such as liberty or freedom and we project that back onto earlier periods where in actual fact that concept did not exist or if it did exist it had very different meanings associated with it. The same goes for the concept of racism. Today we're highly alert to this concept and it's something we talk about a lot. 200 years ago you probably wouldn't find the word racism used very much but that definitely doesn't mean it didn't exist. What we now recognise and call a conspiracy theory can be seen in the history books as far back as classical antiquity. There were lots around at the time of Emperor Nero, for example, from theories that he deliberately started the Great Fire of Rome in AD 64 so that he could clear space for a new palace, to the rumour that he was not really dead after he took his own life four years later. But the actual term conspiracy theory was first used in the late 19th century, and conspiracy theories in the plural didn't become a thing until the mid-20th century. It's been possible to show that actually conspiracy theory begins to emerge in the 1870s. And uh, I would say that basically, if you're looking at the kind of like the whole career of conspiracy theory, as it emerges and as it takes on the meaning and the connotations that we associate with it today, it's about a hundred year process from about 1870 to 1970 and so about by the you know, 1980s, we can see conspiracy theory being used in ways that we would recognise today with this entourage of negative connotations. Andrew's research involved a massive textual analysis of newspapers, searching the archives for references to conspiracy theories. Initially, conspiracy theory was used in a very neutral way. Literally a theory about a crime or conspiracy that had taken place. You never find in the 1870s or at any time in the 19th century really talk of conspiracy theories, that is conspiracy theory in the plural. What you had in the 1870s was in particular contexts uh, of criminal investigation and in particular in newspapers where they report upon those criminal investigations. You have instances where in a particular case, there's speculation about the possibility of a conspiracy. And so these kind of associations, which we have with the term today, that it is outlandish, that it is not tenable, that it's problematic, that was really not so much the case. In part, Andrew says, this reflects the fact that criminal investigations were becoming more scientific. And with that, they began to adopt scientific vocabulary. They're beginning to talk of, you know, theories, evidence, refutation, facts. And then on the other hand, you have newspaper reporters also using the word theory in their attempt to be more objective. Assassinations are a good example of where conspiracy is a plausible explanation of events, especially if the circumstances aren't immediately apparent. For example, it's not absurd to think that there are multiple perpetrators behind the murder of a high-ranking official like a US president. Andrew says there's a clear difference in the way that people discussed Abraham Lincoln's assassination in 1865 versus Andrew Garfield's assassination in 1881. With Lincoln, it was clear from the outset that the assassin, John Wilkes Booth, did not act alone. It was a genuine conspiracy. This speculative dimension about whether it was possibly a conspiracy, very clearly from the very outset, that could be dismissed. And so there was never the need to kind of really to qualify the talk about the assassination of Lincoln with the notion of a theory, because it was quite clear that there was actually a conspiracy. It's different 16 years later in 1881, when Garfield, President James Garfield was assassinated. And in the period after his assassination, there was a lot of speculation about whether Guito, uh, the assassin, was acting alone. And it turned out fairly quickly that he was deranged, this particular assassin. But uh, there were people who were continuing to 
consider the possibility that he hadn't acted alone. And so really in 1881, with this, the second assassination of American president, we find the newspapers then in the early days after the event itself, they were speculating about a conspiracy theory. It was in the mid 20th century that the phrase conspiracy theory started being used in the way that we would recognize today. The philosopher Karl Popper is credited with coining the concept in a number of lectures he gave in 1948, where he began to speak of the conspiracy theory as an invalid way of understanding society. Popper, along with other social scientists, wanted to differentiate between more rational ways of understanding the world from less sophisticated ones. They emphasized that things happened not because God willed it or because there were individual evil agents pulling the strings behind the scenes, but events unfolded as a result of a complicated convergence of often impersonal, social and economic causes. Within the context, for example, of an of a assassination, I think it's quite plausible at the outset to invoke the possibility that there there was a conspiracy. But if you're trying to explain something such as a depression, an economic depression, inflation, even events such as large scale events, such as a revolution, the French Revolution, to say that the French Revolution is the result of a conspiracy. In the 20th century, social scientists, sociologists and historians who were receptive to social science began to argue that that was an overly simplistic way of looking at the way that history works, the way that society works. And so they developed an understanding of conspiracy theory that was negative, that was pejorative. It was the opposite of what they were trying to do. They were saying that this is the right way that we believe to understand society and history, the wrong way is this notion that we call the conspiracy theory. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy is a key moment in how the concept of conspiracy theories developed. And it highlights the inherent issue of when a theory of conspiracy is plausible and when it should probably be dropped. On the basis of what was originally known about the assassination of JFK, it was not entirely implausible to consider the possibility that he actually had fallen victim to a conspiracy and that Lee Harvey Oswald, the assassin, had not been acting alone. Simply the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald was himself shot two days later was in itself a kind of highly suspicious event. It seemed as if Oswald had been silenced. And that was one reason why it did not seem implausible to consider the possibility of a conspiracy. But then a lengthy investigation by the Warren Commission into the assassination, which firmly concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald had in fact acted alone, did not put these conspiracy theories to bed. Lots of people refused to believe the official version of events. They were adamant that there were more sinister forces working behind the scenes to dispose of Kennedy. Assassinations encapsulate the trickiness of defining conspiracy theories and the fact that the concept is the product of two different strands of thinking. On the one hand, a theory of conspiracy, and on the other, that more simplistic way of explaining complex or profound events by referring to evil forces at work. Conspiracy theorists say that the lack of evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald was working in collusion with other groups is itself evidence of a cover-up. This is what's known as the self-sealing quality of conspiracy theories. For Jovan Byford, senior lecturer in social psychology at The Open University, this is how what we label conspiracy theories today fundamentally differs to theories about conspiracies. It's basically about approach to evidence. So when we look at uncovering real-life conspiracies, the most important criteria when it comes to assessing evidence is that one should never fall in the trap of treating the absence of evidence of a conspiracy as a proof that there is a conspiracy. But this, he says, is exactly what conspiracy theorists do. Because they're dealing with very grand, very secret, very sinister conspiracies by the most powerful people in the world, the absence of evidence is something that they expect 
because the people who they believe are conspiring have the power to hide their tracks. But more importantly, they regard the existence of a plot not as a testable hypothesis and something that needs to be verified, but as a fundamental and unshakable principle from which all other evidence gathering and evidence interpretation begins. So that's something to watch out for when dealing with conspiracy theorists. They are irrefutable. Any evidence you present to them showing there isn't a conspiracy theory will be rejected as part of that conspiracy. It's because of this that Jovan is confident that when various archives get opened in 100 years or so, they won't suddenly reveal that various conspiracy theories were actually true. But that's not to say that these archives won't reveal various plots. There's a huge amount of historical precedence for this. If one looks at the Watergate scandal, if one looks at various revelations in the 1950s and 60s, or rather in the 70s about the covert activities of the CIA and other agencies in the United States, the idea that FBI engaged in illegal surveillance and intimidation of, of civil rights activists, that the CIA tried to uh, plotted to kill various uh, international figures like Fidel Castro and so on. So we know that governments engage in secret activity and this is no secret. But he's confident that what will be revealed will be very different to the conspiracy theories that proliferate on websites like Reddit. And that's because conspiracy theorists are interested in different kinds of conspiracies than the ones that actually turn out to be true. An inherent feature of plotting in the real world is that these conspiracies are usually relatively small. The type of conspiracies that conspiracy theorists are interested in tend to be much grander. They tend to assume that All the different events in the world have a common source, so there is always an arch-conspirator who tends to control all the different events, and they seemed to be unable to recognize that actually in real life, uh, real conspiracies rarely work out according to plan. History also shows how conspiracy theorists can be blind to the evidence before them. So when the Watergate scandal was exposed... The conspiracy theorists who were writing at the time in America, who were mainly affiliated with the right, were not interested in this very real-life conspiracy theory. What they actually argued was that the actual conspiracy to bug the Democratic National Committee's headquarters was in itself a conspiracy. So So conspiracy theorists at the time of Watergate thought that the scandal was all part of a secret plot to bring down President Nixon. Similarly, we need to remember that most of the real-life conspiracies, such as the various illegal activities of the CIA or the FBI in the 1950s and 60s, were not identified by conspiracy theorists. On the contrary, they were identified by the New York Times, by journalists, institutions and so on, that conspiracy theorists regard as being at the heart of this new world order and political establishment. Conspiracy theorists got a bad rep partly because of their refusal to play by the sort of rules of democratic society and engage with evidence. For the most part, they were relegated to the margins of serious public debate in the second half of the 20th century. Today, though, there's a feeling that conspiracy theories are on the rise, along with misinformation and fake news. Whether or not they are more prominent now than other points in history is the subject of academic debate. But today, there's definitely a sense that conspiracy theories are being used more by people in power. And as a result, they are no longer a fringe phenomenon. Populist politicians the world over, including Donald Trump, use conspiracy theories to manipulate their electorates. And their followers appear to be particularly receptive to them. For Kasim Kassam, conspiracy theories are always political. If you were to put together a list of what are widely recognised today as conspiracy theories, it seems to me that these theories are political in the sense that they all concern events that have political significance and they also have a political agenda. In fact, I'd want to go further than that and say that they're not just political, but they're actually forms of political propaganda. Their function, their basic role is to advance a political or ideological objective. The idea that 9-11 was faked by the US government so it could wage war in the Middle East is, of course, political. Kasim also points to the prominent false flag conspiracy theory. This is the idea that school shootings in the US, like Sandy Hook, 
where a gunman shot and killed 26 people, were actually staged by an Obama administration that was intent on using the event to strengthen gun control laws. When a bunch of uh, students are killed in a school, that usually results in arguments for greater gun control. And one way to deflect those arguments is to say, of course, that the shootings never happened, that it was a false flag. And that's exactly what Sandy Hook conspiracy theorists did say. Another example that I'd want to bring in that I think is extremely significant, and this is significant historically, is perhaps the most famous notorious conspiracy theory of all time, which is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory put forward in the early part of the 20th century. It's unclear who was responsible for the protocols, possibly members of the Russian secret police, but in any case, it's fairly apparent that that conspiracy theory is not put forward as a piece of serious history. It's a piece of propaganda uh, directed against the Jews, and that's the effect that it had. As a piece of propaganda, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was incredibly influential in adding fuel to the fire of anti-Semitism in the early 20th century, including the Holocaust. It is a fabricated text purporting to be the minutes of a late 19th century meeting of Jewish leaders who discussed their goal of global Jewish hegemony by controlling the press and the world's economies. Adolf Hitler refers to the protocols in his manifesto, Mein Kampf. And despite being a proven fabrication, it is still used by conspiracy theorists today as an example of a coordinated Jewish plot to rule the world. We'll explore this relationship between conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism more later on in the series. Something we have to be mindful of, says Kasim Kassam, is the difference between producers of conspiracy theories and the consumers. So the producer of the theory is the person who came up with the theory in the first place. Now, if you think about the person who came up with the Sandy Hook theory or the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, I mean, it isn't at all necessary or even plausible that they believe their own theories. But when you think about the effectiveness of these theories, the fact that they circulate and have the impact that they have, that, of course, is due in part to the fact that lots of conspiracy theory consumers actually believe these theories. Conspiracy theories often deal with the forces of good and evil. Everything is black and white and everything happens for a reason. This is a big part of their appeal, says Kasim. What conspiracy theories offer are stories. And they are stories that provide what look like meaningful explanations of what would otherwise be random events. You know, so if you think of you know, the death of Princess Diana in, in, in a car crash in Paris, the truth is that you know, these things happen. People do die in car crashes, and she died in a car crash, and there isn't really a whole lot more to it than that. But if you think of her as a victim of a grand conspiracy by the royal family, then suddenly this sort of apparently random event starts to assume a significance and a meaning that it didn't otherwise or wouldn't otherwise have had. We certainly have to be careful of these compelling, easy explanations for hard to explain or random events, particularly when they are used to manipulate voters or stir hatred towards certain sections of society. In our next episode of this five-part expert guide to conspiracy theories, we will be delving into the psychology of belief in them to find out what types of people are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories and why. Subscribe to The Ant Hill to get it when it launches next week. And in the meantime, check out theconversation.com to read more research about conspiracy theories by academic experts. Michael Butter, an American studies scholar at Tübingen University in Germany, has written about the myth that the CIA invented the concept of conspiracy theories. And Jovan Byford has written a how-to guide to help you spot if something is a conspiracy theory or not. A big thanks to all the researchers who spoke to us for this episode and City University of London for letting us use their studios. Special thanks to Claire Birchall, Peter Knight and Michael Butter, who've helped bring this podcast into being, and to the Cost Action Compact for funding it. The Ant Hill is produced by me, Annabelle Bly, and Gemma Ware. The sound design is by Eloise Stevens, with original music by Nita Saal. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>